A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. You have also forgotten the exhortation addressed to you as children. My son, do not disdain the discipline of the Lord, or lose heart when reproved by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son he acknowledges. Endure your trials as discipline. God treats you as his sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? At that time, all discipline seems a cause not for joy, but for pain. Yet later, it brings the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. So strengthen your dropping hands and your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet, that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for all that holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one be deprived of the grace of God, that no bitter root spring up and cause trouble, through which many may become defiled. The word of the Lord. The Lord's kindness is everlasting to those who fear him. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all my being, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. But the kindness of the Lord is from eternity to eternity towards those who fear him, and his justice towards children's children and on those who keep his covenant. The Lord's kindness is everlasting to those who fear him. Dominus Fobiscum, Lectio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marco, Jesus departed from there and came to his native place, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished. They said, where did this man get all this? What kind of wisdom has been given him? What mighty deeds are wrought by his hands? Is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? 
And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his native place, and among his own kin, and in his own house. So he was not able to perform any mighty deed there, apart from curing a few sick people by laying his hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Verbum Domini. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the Pope has asked us during this year to celebrate a year of faith. He has asked us to do this as the cornerstone of what has been referred to in the last few years as the new evangelization. The new evangelization is based on the idea that even in traditionally Catholic countries, many people take their faith for granted, they don't investigate their faith, and they don't connect often their faith with doing. And so missionary territory is no longer just something that is outside of Europe or America, but missionary territory now are even places that have been taught the faith for centuries. How do we take our faith for granted? Well, one of the ways we do this is by thinking that faith only can involve in the intellectual investigation, but with no personal commitment at all, and no real entry into the mystery. In other words, it's just like something I learn in a book, but it has no relationship to my life. As a teacher, this has come to my knowledge. Every teacher experiences this, I suppose, but it's particularly troubling when it comes to teaching the faith, especially to people who are seminarians. You'll give this class and you think, oh, I finally got them to see the depth and power of the Catholic religion. I finally got them to realize what it means to say God took flesh. I finally got them to plunge themselves into the supernatural order by sanctifying grace. And so this hand goes up. Yes, do you have a question? How can I elevate your world? Is this to be on our test? Do we have to know this? <laughs> And you want to say, many prophets and kings long to see what you see and didn't see it. And that's all you want to know. And this can't be all that uncommon an experience because I was giving this little lecture about this to my students and someone found this on the internet. Jesus took his disciples up the mountain and gathering them around them, he taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and the Beatitudes. Then Simon Peter said, do we have to write this down? And Andrew said, are we supposed to know this? And James said, well, we have a test on it. And Philip said, what if we don't know it? And Bartholomew said, do we have to hand this in? And John and the other disciples didn't have to learn this. And Matthew said, when do we get out of here anyway? And Judas said, what does all this have to do with real life? Then one of the Pharisees present asked to see Jesus' lesson plans and inquired of Jesus' his terminal objectives in the cognitive domain. And the, piece ends, and the piece ends by saying, and Jesus wept. <laughs> now, I can understand exactly how Jesus feels in this, and also I can apply this to the gospel passage today. Here Christ comes in fulfillment of what John says in his gospel. He came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. Jesus comes to his native place. All these people have known him since he was a child. And yet, they're scandalized at him. They don't open themselves to receiving even his miracles. And in fact, the stimulus for our belief, our faith, because it's supernatural knowledge, God doesn't leave us bereft to uh, affirm our religion by pure will, are precisely prophecies of miracles. When he's asked, our Lord, 
are you he who is the comer shall we look for another? What does he say? Go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind see, the lame walk, which is all fulfillments of the prophecy of Isaiah. Look, I'm fulfilling all the prophecies. He doesn't say yes directly, but he tells them everything that's been told of me, I'm doing. I must be this person. These people in Nazareth, they look at him and they say, he's so ordinary. He's so ordinary. How can this person be the Messiah? He can't possibly be the Messiah. And the very ordinariness of this whole thing, the fact that they should have lived with him every day, leads them to jealousy. It also leads them to disappointment in him. And it leads them to reject him, the very people with whom our Lord grew up. And notice what Christ's reaction to this is, which also proves, incidentally, the truth of his human nature. He was amazed. He wondered at their lack of faith. You know, here I am, I'm closest to you, and you don't accept me. I'm the reason that the whole world was created, and you don't accept me because I'm too plain for you. What do you want, spectacular stuff? And of course, that's what they want. Many people, when it comes to faith and religion, think that their catechism that they learned when they were a child and the daily application of this is just too ordinary. It can't possibly be very deep. They also think that, you know, and we have martyrs today, Japanese martyrs in Japan, they also think, you know, if I could just have a little miracle or must demand of me something really, really extraordinary. Some people think that the more something hurts in religion, the better it is. Since we canonize martyrs, it must be the pain that's the important thing, right? So if I can just afflict myself more and more in a kind of sadomasochistic destruction of myself, that's the key to merit. That's the key to perseverance in faith. Well, all the writers in the book are clear about the fact that merit has nothing to do with the pain. It's not the pain of the martyr that makes the martyrdom of value. It's the love of the truth. In fact, what shall we be judged on at the end of our lives? Courage, yes. We need courage to persevere but it's a courage based on love. So the very ordinariness of Christ leads them to reject him. And sometimes in religion, people just want the spectacular, spectacular, more visions, more miracles, more whatever. One spiritual author I read once said, most people wouldn't walk across the street to witness a hidden act of patience in a marriage, but they'll sell all they possess and cross oceans to continue with sights of visions and miracles. And yet every spiritual author in the book tells us that visions and miracles exist to encourage the ordinary acts of patience. And this is the primary martyrdom of faith. And it's also because faith is a supernatural knowledge which does involve the truth. We have to know and study it. But it's not a dull exercise of just studying propositions in a book, though the propositions are important. It's the persons the propositions are about. So faith not only involves study. I remember I once taught a class in high school, and my best religion student in the Catholic school was a Muslim. And I used to tell the Catholic school kids, I said, aren't you ashamed? Aren't you ashamed? This person understands your religion better than you do, and he doesn't believe in it. But it's not just a matter of study. It's also a matter of love. Both go together. You can't play off one against the other. Because who am I loving? Who am I knowing about? the person I want to think about, to think about God all my life. Now, we have an example of suffering, and the primary suffering, which isn't exterior suffering, in the first reading today. The Apostle Paul has been talking to us about faith, the essence of things unseen, the substance of things to be hoped for. When a person takes seriously the fact that faith is a grace that was given to them, they didn't merit it, None of us deserves to believe. And when they open themselves, see, that's what the people of Nazareth didn't do. God is certainly powerful enough to save them, but he never saves us against our will. And they refused to open themselves to him because he was so ordinary. When in our ordinary life, we begin to open ourselves to a transformation in God, which faith brings us, this is a suffering. It's a suffering on two levels. The first is we have to address the issues of our ego. As one of the monks of the desert put it, we become a martyr to our own conscience. 
Paul tells us, do not disdain the discipline of the Lord or lose heart when reproved by him. A calm sea will never make a sailor. The fact that we often are in turmoil because we're addressing the issue of our own desire, our weakness to dominate and abuse others, and we have to try to root this out through grace, not just by our own power, but through grace. This is a suffering. It's much deeper than physical martyrdom. It's a spiritual martyrdom. And you and I have to go through it every single day. The second suffering, which is even deeper, is when a person finally allows God to begin to transform their lives because God wants to elevate us to know him and to love him as he knows and loves himself. And in religion, this is often like the honeymoon ending. When you came to church, you experienced warm fuzzies. Now it all dies. You feel dead within, like a dry, weary land without water. But if you're trying to strive and live your religion, it can't be, if you're not aware of being in a state of mortal sin, it can't be because God isn't present to you. But he's trying to change your way of thinking and loving to his. And this is not our natural way of doing things. We have to learn to surrender and allow him to work in us in his way. And this is something we do not want to do because we want to reign. At some point in our life, we have this little thing, oh, I've kept this corner where I still call the shots. Who really calls the shots finally in their life? Nobody. God's the one that calls the shots. We sort of, what, report for duty, pretty much? We open ourselves to receiving what's offered to us. Paul tells us, at the time, all discipline seems a cause not for joy but for pain. But later, when a person allows themselves to be transformed, when they allow the suffering of their ego to be consumed in love, it brings forth the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those trained by it. But we have to be sure that we keep in mind, in this regard, there is nothing that is just ordinary, just because it's not spectacular. I find Catholics very odd sometimes, because when you talk to them about virtue, they'll say, well, gee, I'm not like Mother Teresa, I can't pick up the dying on the streets of Calcutta, I must not be virtuous. And you want to say, well, that's what God wants for Mother Teresa. But a person who gets up and takes care of their kid in the middle of the night when they're crying and they don't want to because they're losing sleep, they feel exhausted, but they do this because of love and charity, that's virtuous. The virtues of the ordinary state, ordinary things in life, are the place where this is proved. Francis de Sales was the great apostle of this. He said there are many virtues, but things like magnanimity, fortitude, dying for the faith like the Mars did today, and many of us are not called to these. But he says the ordinary virtues like patience, humility, those things are virtues that are more necessary because they occur every day with the people with whom we live. And that's where the truth and suffering of the gospel is finally proved. The people like Paul Miki and John Baptist and his companions who suffered today, they were prepared for the ultimate sacrifice of martyrdom, which was a grace again given to them. They shouldn't seek it. We're not foolishly courageous, nor are we cowards. We show up when we're supposed to. They were prepared for this by the everyday martyrdom to their own conscience, which they had to experience. But in order to do that, they have to begin to see the extraordinary in the ordinary. Now, visions and miracles are great. I'm a Catholic. I believe in them, certainly. But you know, they're only matters, according to one of the popes, Pius X in Lamentabili, of human faith. When the church approves of one, it merely says there's nothing contrary to this. And as far as human evidence can tell, let's say Our Lady appeared there and things like that. They're not like the Articles of the Creed. The Articles of the Creed are matters of divine faith. And it's heresy not to believe in one of them because you can't love God if you don't believe everything about him. So as we are going through our own lives, when we're experiencing being honed, when we're experiencing being refined like the refiner's fire, how does a refiner refine metal? He puts it in a crucible, 
He does violence to it, he heats it. As the metal becomes aqueous, the impurities flow to the top. If you ask a refiner how he knows when the metal is ready to be fashioned into a beautiful vessel, he will say, as he scrapes away the impurities, when I can see my image in the metal, then I know it's ready. When God allows us to suffer this interior martyrdom, and he allows many of us to suffer many exterior pains, but the problem is when it attacks our interior self for lack of courage. When God allows us to do this, it isn't because he doesn't love us. One of the biggest problems with rejecting Jesus, I talked about this Monday, is the fact that the new image of Christ separates him from his cross. The new religion wants to say we're not saved by the cross, but from the cross. This is impossible. The cross was not a regrettable incident in Christ's life that he wouldn't have had to suffer had he just been more pluralistic. It was the reason he came to earth. And our share in the cross, we make up what's lacking in the cross of Christ. Nothing's lacking in his cross as far as atonement. But we make up for who we apply it to what does Paul say to us today? Strengthen your drooping hands and your weak knees. When you are tempted to leave your religion because it involves suffering, or you can't see how God could be present in these ordinary things, or you don't want to go through this, you lose courage. Look to him. Look to our word made flesh who came to share our life that he might lead us to heavenly mysteries and make straight paths for your feet and your soul that what is lame, those places where you can't love as God does, may not be dislocated but healed.